Crude oil from different sources varies widely, and these different crude oils vary in toxicity. Oftentimes, other chemicals are added to lessen some of the impacts of spills. They have toxic impacts as well and interactions. So these oil spills affect many species, aquatic animals, terrestrial animals, and people as well. One of the worst spills in the United States was that of the Exxon Valdez in 1989 in Alaska. Here you see some birds that died from being oiled and an otter, a sea otter that's oiled. The sea otter effort to rehabilitate these animals was considerable, but it did not work well at all. The workers on the beach are trying to clean up the mess. Uh, this was a problem that really should have been avoided, could have been avoided as well. In 2010, we experienced the Deepwater Horizon spill, the blowout of the well, that was so severe in terms of its impacts on humans and on wildlife. You would think that would trigger responsible stewardship and mindful regulations on activity of offshore drilling to ensure that it's safe. But unfortunately, the current administration is weakening regulations and expanding areas to be drilled. The Deepwater Horizon blowout released methane with an explosion and a great volume of, of petroleum. There were 11 workers killed immediately and 17 more injured. Almost 5 million barrels of oil was released over 84 days. It's a huge spill. 1,100 miles of shoreline was oiled. So this was raw petroleum hydrocarbons, some of which would be volatile and blow away eventually, others non-volatile. They used controlled burning to try to minimize some of the impacts on the ecosystem. Um, but the burning, of course, as with the situation in the St. Lawrence estuary produces carcinogens and so and other toxic gases and particulates. So it's not an ideal solution. You'd like not to have to do it. They also used a dispersant, which is a combination of detergents and petroleum distillates and butoxyethanol and propylene glycol. And with those dispersants, the oil does disperse into the water column, so less oil is on the surface. But that means that less could be cleaned up. And that means it's solubilized, so it impacts with the aquatic organisms. The ecosystem is disrupted. And the dispersants also have their own toxic impacts and their interactions with the hydrocarbons. So you have narcosis and other neurologic effects in people that are possible. You have eye, skin, and respiratory damage that can happen. At high enough doses, you might have hemolysis and kidney and liver damage. Of course, it wasn't just people, it just wasn't the workers that were out there trying to clean up the mess or that were on this rig in the beginning. It was also wildlife, birds, and dolphins, and sea turtles, and fish, and invertebrates, and plants. There was poisoning across the board. It was reported that 100,000 people were exposed, and this included residents of the area. Um, but there were tens of thousands of workers dealing with the spill. Um, now, some of their impacts can be disputed because they had previous workplace exposures to other contaminants, and many of them were smokers in their personal lives as well. The clinical signs and lesions that were associated with some of the effects are shown here. Nausea, eye irritation, nose irritation, pharynx pharynx irritation, lung irritation, difficult breathing, irritation of the skin with rash and vesicles, headaches, inability to concentrate, fatigue, and sometimes diarrhea. These effects, their severity, their linkage to the problem are still being studied. There's a long-term study going on with National Institutes of Health uh, funded by the settlement that was imposed on British Petroleum by the U.S. government. Uh, the Corexa dispersant seems to aggravate some of these problems and expose workers. Now, here you see some of those workers, and of course they're wearing protective clothing, and they're going home to bathe at night. Of course, that's not happening. With the wildlife, their exposures are far more extensive. It's important to realize that 
oil spills are not just in the ocean, they're also coastal and they're inland as well. Uh, so there are problems with drilling sites and pumping stations, roads and roadsides where there are accidents, railroad accidents, bridge accidents, lakes can be contaminated, rivers can be contaminated, there can be pools of petroleum on the surface. Um, many different problems arise. In this photo from the 1990s, you see a number of oiled birds. This was a problem in South Dakota and many other places because oil was allowed to accumulate in pits on the surface. Now this problem is prevented through either having the oil stored in tanks or the pits are netted off. This is an example of effective regulations. Petroleum affects feathers. It undermines waterproofing and insulation which are made possible by the interlocking of feather barbicels. So the barbicels don't lock the way they should. Even when there's no sheen on the water from the petroleum, there may be enough oil there to cause this disruption. Birds may lose the ability to fly normally so they cannot reach their feeding grounds. They may be unable to trap air in their feathers so they become hypothermic and they may not be able to float so they can drown. Petroleum is irritating to skin, to mucous membranes, can cause problems with hemorrhagic gastroenteritis. It can cause inhalation pneumonia when it's aspirated. It's also immunotoxic, so you can get increased infections. The birds that are oiled become stressed. They may become debilitated. They can be dehydrated. They may experience renal failure with visceral gout. It's, it can be devastating. Birds may also develop hemolytic anemia when they're affected by petroleum. This may be due to the polyaromatic hydrocarbons in some oils. They can have methemoglobinemia, Heinz bodies, hemosiderin may accumulate in the liver. This shows you some common mirrors and you'll notice that not very many are in the normal range. Most of these oiled birds were anemic, having considerable impact on some of them. Birds exposed to petroleum also have reproductive toxicity problems. Um, when they get oil on their feathers and come back to the nest, some of that oil gets onto the eggs, and the oiled eggshells cause embryo toxicity and sometimes embryo mortality. A study was done with wedge-tailed shearwaters. They were dosed with just 1 to 2 mLs of crude oil on their breast. And the oiled birds, as compared to the controls, the oil birds had nest abandonment, higher rates, fewer eggs laid, lower hatching rates in the eggs that were laid, and the survivors fed less as compared to the controls as well. Wildlife and other animals can be exposed to oil from different sources. Uh, so it's important to be sure that you know which source is on the animal. To do that, you can collect oil from the environment and then you can swab or wipe down some of the exposed feathers or fur of the animals and separately wrap this and freeze it and send it to the laboratory. You want to check with the laboratory and oil spill experts ahead of time. But each oil specimen will have a unique fingerprint. It will change somewhat over time and experts will understand how that takes place and account for it. But when you have that information you can be able to figure out who's responsible and they can be asked to pay for the problem, the treatment of the animals, the diagnostic work, and the cleanup. You do need to have good chain of custody, so you have to have excellent records, good labeling, proper transport, secure storage, and analysis by a capable lab. In terms of treating oil birds, you really have to be careful because they can hurt you and so you want to protect your eyes especially. Proper goggles would be a smart thing. Um, you want to remember that causing a bird to vomit or trying to lavage the digestive tract is contraindicated because of increased risk of aspiration of the petroleum. Um, you want to also note that activated charcoal is unlikely to have much value and it may increase the risk of aspiration. 
And one of the first things that might need to be done is to flush the bird's eyes with sterile saline solution. Try to remove the, the uh, petroleum that's there. Symptomatic and supportive care can be vital for oiled birds. Uh, I, it's important also to work with a seasoned expert who's dealt with these birds before. And they should help with training and they should help guide triage. So you decide which ones you're going to be able to help and which ones you cannot help and you should euthanize. It's important to stabilize the patient, not rushing to bathe. The stress can be overwhelming. You correct problems like hypothermia and dehydration as a first order of business. If there are respiratory signs or if the birds are coughing, uh, they probably have already aspirated and serial x-rays may be really important. With aspiration pneumonia, antibiotics may be necessary. And if oxygen is available, it might really be helpful. When it comes time to do the washing of a bird with oil on it, it's important not to use the kind of detergent that's put into an automatic dishwasher, which would be too caustic. Ideally, you'll have soft water available. Um, sometimes, what you may have is seawater, and that might have some value. And ideally, you could try a wash with uh, seawater and a rinse, followed by a freshwater wash and a rinse, as that was somewhat more effective than just fresh water alone. Uh, the water temperature should be controlled. It needs to be warm but not hot to avoid hyperthermia. And you also want to uh, select the right liquid dish detergent. Uh, Dawn in the United States has been used a lot and it's very effective. About a one to five percent solution has been oftentimes employed. The same product has different names in other parts of the world. It's called Fairy Liquid in some places, it's called Joy in others. Uh, but it's the same formula, and it's the one that uh, most people have had success with. The individuals who help in decontaminating oiled birds have to be pre-trained. They need to be calm and collected. The place where the work is done should be warm and quiet, free of drafts. They have to be able to rinse with warm water after these detergents have been used and until beads of water roll away freely and the downy feathers are able to be fluffed up. Complete rinsing is really important to get there. And blotting dry with clean towels and then placing in a warm holding pen away from drafts can, can help these birds to survive. This image from the International Bird Rescue Center shows the same pelican before and after proper bathing. Clean birds that are healthy enough usually begin to preen immediately after bathing. Um, within 24 hours or of bathing, they need access to pools of water. This will help them to swim around and to do more preening and to restore their waterproofing. In the longer haul, we need to get beyond fossil fuels because with all the extreme problems, not just with oiled wildlife, but climate change and acidification of the oceans, it's not trivial. Working toward a new energy system will have its own chemical mixtures involved, industries involved. Finding out whether those products are safe is another source of career opportunities. Veterinarians are needed in these industries, toxicologists, pathologists, and others.